Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Eric Olofsson, and I'm a founder and a creative director of at Grinding Gear Games. I hope you enjoyed all the announcements so far. Uh, Exilecon sure beats our own expectations. This talk is called The World of Path of Exile 2. And PoE2 is something that uh, has been a very large part of my work for the last two years or so. So that's because in parallel of normal leagues and uh, expansions, many people at GDG have been working on this in the background. So it's really great to be able to finally show it and talk about it. So first I will talk a little bit about the atmosphere in Path of Exile 2. The talk starts out a bit more philosophical um, about the PoE atmosphere, but then quickly becomes more practical with some example areas of the first act. I will then talk about some of the updated characters and last but not least about the items. In the very first day of development in Chris Garage, uh, there was a motto to get the player to actual gameplay within five minutes of signing up. The first few minutes of the game are very important for setting the correct tone. Everything there has to be chosen carefully and should be memorable and understandable at the basic level without any long segments of reading or listening. Many of you might be remembering the original ship scene um, I've seen that some people still are longing to get back to something like that, and I agree there was something special about it, uh, about how depressing it was, and that's like depressing in a good way because it sets the tone of the game perfectly. Um, with PoE2, I hope that we have found our way back to something similarly impactful. So this is how PoE2 starts out. Is to be hanged from the neck until dead. Let your souls feed the first ones, and your bodies feed the land. Hear me, ancestors. Your right to fear me. The secrets of this world are. Dark and gritty has been a catchphrase for PoE since the early days. Um, and with PoE too, we have taken things further. Dark is much more than just visual darkness, and everyone loves dungeons, statues, and blood, but the world actually also has to be very uncaring, and surviving should be a struggle. Uh, so the protagonist is a side character in a bigger story, and you start out the game as a nobody, and nobody cares about you or your death until you prove yourself. So action RPGs, they are always about power fantasy in the sense that you blow down hordes of enemies. But to feel rewarding, it has to come from the player making the right choices, and it, it's, not, it's not as satisfying if it happens on rails. With PoE2, we are building a world that uh, the player has to conquer through cleverness or through sheer persistence. Things aren't going to go your way automatically. The player has to actually figure things out and get good to succeed. The story is also one of uh, imperfect information, where information is given out, given out in snippets to build the atmosphere. You get a keyhole glimpse into the story and the world, uh, and a lot of it is left up to the imagination of the player. If everything was spelled out too much, I think something would get lost. From a developer perspective, this also helps uh, creating a world that can evolve constantly. By the very nature of PoE, things stay flexible and things get added and removed as time goes by. The world of Rayclaws is a cyclical one where there's always another mysterious threat ready to destroy the world. Um, so I will now go through a few select areas of the first act. This is the riverbank area, uh, where the player gets washed up after escaping the gallows. 
one of the more memorable things with PUE one was waking up on a beach and desperately whacking crabs with a driftwood club in order to survive. Uh, the same is true here, and even though the time and location is different, uh, we want to capture that same feel in PUE 2. The rain that depressively rains down on you is new. Um, the cold and wet mud uses more modern, physically correct rendering, and uh, the gnarly trees use 3D scan techniques I'll go into more later about. In the first area, we'll of course encounter zombies like before, and an interesting thing with a game like PUE is that um, since it's been in development so long, Zombies have had animation and polish and skill moves added over time to create a very large set for use in all kinds of situations. So this means that it's, it's no small task to, to redo even a simple monster like that. Uh, but the, the new models, rigs and animations, that's something we have to do because with the sort of better under the hood uh, technology, we will be able to in the long run, create more and much, much better animations faster. OK, so this is a screenshot of the Clearfell encampment. So uh, part of the atmosphere in PUE is, uh, demands towns to be quite scruffy looking and look like they are under siege. So, um, and in this screenshot, you can also see a updated town portal in the bottom left corner. Um, so we have updated pretty much all core visual effects. Um, so that's like level up, spell surges, like things like Quicksilver Flask. Um, yeah, and also for the first time you will be able to exit town in uh, different directions. So if you look closely at the screenshot, you can see the exit in the top left. So area transitions are also a new thing. Uh, that are looking much better now compared to the white block. Um, anyway, the, the, that exit to the top left could be closed and either the top right or bottom right one would be open instead. So this is, this is part of a new world map system that is generated per character. And a summary would be that we put another layer of randomization on top of the normal um, level randomization. So there will be a, a talk about that later by Rhys Abrahams, if, you're, if you want to learn more about that. And here's just a couple of quick examples showing that the layout of the entire act can change. <laughs> so when we set out to do development for the um, original PoE 2, uh, one of the goals was to get the, the early games, um, the, the early part of the game up to modern quality. Because as it is in PoE, we, like we added acts on top of them after each other, and we're like a larger company, and we have more advanced graphics the further we go. And the oldest area in the current PO is actually the forest, since it was the first act we made, since we wanted to first make the second act and then go back and make the first act, because we could then use some of what we learned to make the first one better. And since the forest in PoE is so old, it, well, it was extra satisfying to make the first act of PoE 2 a forest because of that. So here's a screenshot of the, the old forest area. So this is the new forest. It's just the area is called the old forest. Um, and this, this remake also gave us a second chance to reimagine what uh, a forest should be in a dark and gritty game. Uh, so this time the focus was much more on occult witches and werewolves than instead of bandits. Okay, so we have many several, uh, we have several different werewolves in the act, but this one happens to be especially creepy. And this one was so awesome, so we decided to make the, the, the werewolf transformation skill using this as a base model. So, well, I hope you will enjoy playing the demo later and getting rushed by groups of these guys. Uh, so here's a screenshot of the graveyard area. 
and you can't have a dark and gritty game without a proper gothic graveyard. And we did have some assets before in Feltram Ruins, but, but we never really did it properly. Um, so it's quite strange to have a game that tries to be dark and gritty and not have a proper graveyard. So we spent a lot of effort to get this area right. Um, one of the techniques used um, a lot here is 3D scans. So 3D scanning, or photogrammetry as it's called, lets you create a model from a lot of photos around the same object. So this method is especially good for getting really realistic and gritty textures. So for an artist, it, it can be really hard to know the patterns that rain and dirt would create on a statue, but and exactly where the moss would grow and so on. But with the 3D scan, nature just solves all of that. And all we needed to do was to find some ancient graveyards in real life and go to work. So New Zealand is great and everything, but it's quite lacking when it comes to really old buildings and Gothic medieval ruins and that kind of thing. So we found a company in Poland that were able to go travel around to locations in Europe to create models from us. And here you can see one of the 3D scans in the game uh, next to the cornered witch. There's quite a lot of work to make, uh, make game-ready assets from scans. So we used yet another company to make sure the polygon co count was low and to fix all the small problems that the automatic process doesn't solve in a good way. So here's a screenshot of the hunting grounds. This is an example of an area using several new cool techniques. So we have a lot of the 3D scan use in the overgrown stone wall in the background, on the pebble road, and on the trees. And you can also see a modular bramble creation tool uh, being used, where it's a little bit like painting brambles on top of walls and trees. And this area also uses a new pre -calc pre-calculated ray tracing uh, grass technique. And if you're interested in the more technical side, then I recommend you listen to uh, Alexander Sanikov's talk, Rendering Tech in Path of Exile, later. OK, so this is a screenshot of the Iron Manor, uh, which is the final area of the act. So this area is a good example of how we now make walls that face the lower end of the screen. Um, uh, they are much shorter than the one that's, that face the upper end of the screen. Uh, so this makes it so that you, you can see your character when you run close to a wall, but it still lets us have top-facing walls that are tall and impressive. And normally we try to go for dark and claustrophobic areas, but this means we can make much more epic-looking things when it's appropriate. Okay, so the manner of uh, was also one of the first areas when we almost completely created uh, all the assets by assets sheets with big amount of detail that we outsourced to another company that does the, most of the consuming, uh, the time consuming modeling work. Um, after we get the building blocks back, our environment artists at GDG try to put them together in as many and as interesting ways as possible. So this is just showing the sheer volume of assets that goes into one place. OK, so in this manner uh, and in the areas around it, we have several monsters that take advantage of subsurface scattering and a parallax effect. So basically, we can fake both depth and uh, transparency to get these types of disgusting looking blood monsters and blood bags. Okay, and now on to the characters. So this is one of the very earliest pieces of concept art made for the Marauder, Witch, and Ranger. And this was even before they got their proper class names. So they were simply referred to as the Strength, Dex, and Int characters. If I remember correctly, these drawings were made as the very first thing when I arrived in, arrived in Auckland, before I had even gotten a, a permanent place to sleep. So this is almost 14 years ago now. And I have to say I missed those days because I had the time to actually sit and draw things. 
Uh, but yeah, those days were a lot simpler. But the things we can do now are, of course, so much bigger and better. So there's no comparison. And nowadays we have a, a, a team of concept artists that are much better. Um, and we started out with PUE2. We knew that the player characters was on top of the list of what we had to remake, uh, both from a looks point of view, but also to get them much better and easier to work with under the hood. The rigs or skeletons needed to be um, much more detailed and consistent. One horrible example of our old rigs was the Templar. Uh, so apart from the neck issue, he was also made left-handed, which caused all types of problems, like holding his items upside down and like getting skill effects playing backwards. And, uh, it was it's just a horrible mess. Um, with a quick pace, you get thrown into a game like PUE 2. It is um, important that you get the type of character, the type of gameplay to expect just from a a uh, quick glance of the characters. So we wanted to keep the general gist of each character class very similar to, to, to before, and to keep the colors or attribute wheel filled. So with that I mean there will always be a specific attribute in the skill tree, which means that the character at, uh, archetypes will still stay very similar. So you will always have a pure strength character, for example, and there will always be an index character and so on. Okay, so the Marauder was one of the first um, that fell into place. So we already had a wide variety of Karui culture uh, groundwork made in 2.0, The Awakening. So this was all the areas and monsters related to Kaum, um, which made it easy, like it even made it into the backplate uh, of the logo at that time. So, with the work of Jason Hong, we quickly got to a concept uh, of the character that felt right. So, here's the final design, which is quite similar to what you will be able to play in the demo today. And here's the final model. Uh, when, when we did the modeling, we had a lot of time to go back and forth on the exact details, like the, the colors and the, the tattoos. So, for example, we use um, more red instead of green to match the strength color, instead of the green jade that the concept had. Okay, so the reindeer was also quite easy to make, mostly because it was almost a straight remake of the old character. And here we have the final concept art by Qingyi Li. And here's the final model. Um, with the updated rigs, I hope we will be able to make her move and jump around much more quickly to make her properly represent dexterity. Okay, so the witch character was something that was quite hard to do, or it, it, it had the longest process with a wide concept stage. So we tried a lot of iteration, but everything we tried didn't quite seem to do it. Uh, and there seems to be something very special about the original witch. So we, we often used her in promotion material, and there's something about her looking very vulnerable in comparison to the horrible world of Rayclost. And there must also be a reason why she's so popular in fan art competitions. Uh, okay, so here's the, the finished witch. As you can see, we ended up quite close to the original one. Uh, except the design is much more refined and detailed. Okay, here's a, here's a close-up uh, showing the new type of detail that our modern textures go into. So you can see how the eyes and lips are more wet looking in the light reflection. Um, like it's very small and sharp compared to the skin in her face, for example. And the hair uses a flow map that determines the direction of the hair so that it gets uh, just the right amount of shine. The hair also uses a texture offset uh, rastering technique to make sure that the edges appear a little bit fuzzy, just like hair does. And here we have a comparison of the old and new characters. Uh, so we tried our best to keep the, the soul of each class intact 
Um, even though they are different people at a different time in PoE2 compared to PoE1. Um, and everything has an increased consistency, consistency um, and it means we can quite easily do things like skin color and gender swaps. So all the attack times between the characters will be the same, which means that we, we can do things like, for example, a we take the, the Scion rig and animations and apply it to a Templar. So we're not quite sure how we will do this, but maybe it will be microtransactions or maybe some other way. Uh, we're not quite ready how to show that yet. Uh, and here's a bonus comparison. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> yeah, so. It's, it's been a very long time goal for me to kill all the Templar memes, and <laughs> with PoE2, I hope they will be gone. <laughs> uh, we, we are quite not, we're not quite ready to show that yet. Um, so, items have always been a focus, if not the focal point of the game. Um, with the sequel, we are updating every single armor and weapon. A good benchmark is that we want items to really look like ancient things with a rich history. So basically, we want the items to be something that looks like you can find them in a museum. So, and we also want items to feel like physical things that you have ownership of. So we really dislike the, the sort of simplified um, one-slot items, and if anything, we would want to take the things in the, in the other direction. So, um, for example, like if you imagine a system where you drag your items around and it sort of dangles and clanks, and you, when you throw it in the inventory, it sort of bounces around. So that might not happen in PoE2, but maybe in PoE3. Um, so all items, they will have a full progression from low to high level, and you'd be, be able to enjoy the, the full range going from the trashiest looking chest plate to something really like big, like shining and cool, like an end game glorious plate. So we already have multiple uh, dedicated people working on non-MTX items right now, so there finally is light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to getting all the uniques uh, with their own models as well. Okay, so here's a work in progress, glorious plate. So this is where Jonathan, our technical director, came in and things looked like shit. <laughs> so we went back and added a lot of separation between various plates in the armor. For, so for example, the chest area of the armor is now cut up in three different rigid pieces that slide against each other. So before the metal, they just bend and stretch in an unrealistic manner, uh, to just to follow the animations of the characters. Um, and we also have a more complicated player skeleton now that allows us to get like a proper bouncing shoulder pads and elbow and knee pads will move much more not naturally. So this also means that artists, they have to, when making armors, they have to actually think like, medieval armor smiths. Okay, so here we have an updated occultist vestment. So we now attach many more pieces that are affected by physics. So if you look very closely, there's a symbol on her chest that bounces as you run, and we can have larger sleeves that dangle and moves physically correct. Um, the design of this armor is also a good example where you get nice looking results by mixing several types of materials, so, for example, all the soft cloth and the hard and shiny metal pieces. Okay, so here you see the new shaman robe base type. So this is a good example of many small details, like the, the bouncing teeth on her shoulder. Uh, on her back, we also have a cloth mesh that is influenced by both physics and by the character animations. And this, it's, it's something that is technically tricky to do, but basically it means that we can do cloaks that sit much more realistically and correctly on the shoulders. 
of characters. Okay, so another feature uh, is to have masked areas where the, the color of armors can change. So this means we can do dice, which lets players customize and match the look of the characters. And at one point, maybe six years ago in the office, we, someone made a joke poster uh, called that uses the logo Path of Textile. <laughs> and that's strangely prophetic. It, it will, we'll be getting there. So currently we have a main and a secondary color, but we will also try to add like various shaders, like making the metal, uh, making the armor like metal looking or wet looking. And yeah, exactly how this will work is still not decided though. And to wrap the item section up, we have a quick comparison between the old and new Marauder in a glorious plate. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm adding a short uh, bonus section on sound because I think it needs to be mentioned that, um, uh, well, it, it plays such a big part of the atmosphere of the game. So it's, I can't go so much into it here because you actually need to, like, you need, really need to play to, to, to get a proper feel of it. But as an example, we added a system where we have different footstep sounds depending on which surface you're running on. And we also have different sounds depending on which features you run um, near. So for example, if we have a thick forest edge, we have like different bird sounds and things there. And also we have a huge amount of custom dialogue recorded for monsters, uh, where the focus is much more on the atmosphere than the sort of just normal fighting sounds now. And yeah, I, I urge you to listen to the sound specifically when you get to play the demo later, if you haven't already. OK, so now it's time for the Q&A. And I should also mention that we are hiring. So if you or you if you know anyone that's especially talented in one of the artistic fields, then please contact us. Okay, and that's how you submit questions. All right, Ooh. Mike, there we go. How you guys doing? I'll be uh, moderating for you guys today, so if you want to submit your questions, add the link. I'll ask them to Eric as they come through. Uh, while you guys start getting all that ready, uh, I'll start with a little bit of my own stuff. Uh, so, with uh, Path of Exile 2, we're traveling 20 years into the future. Um, yes. And naturally, those first three uh, kind of zones, uh, Riverbed, Clearfell, and the Felling, are uh, going to be major kind of components of how we communicate that. Can you kind of talk about how we planned out those zones in relation to trying to tell people that they're in a new place, new time? Uh, there, there's not so much about the, the new time yet in, in that sense. It's, it's, it's much more something that you will f uh, find out along the, along the storyline. And we, we will, of, of course, have a lot of sort of throwbacks in the, in the storyline where you get to find out sort of what happened and what the player, like the effects of what the players did in PUE1, how it sort of turned out later. Yeah, I mean, in the uh, early zones, we see kind of immediately, uh, it's a kind of a logging encampment, something that I don't think we've ever really seen in Path of Exile. It was that kind of factored into the way we decided uh, how we wanted to use that zone and the zones surrounding it? Well, it's... So we, we, the first thing was we, we needed to have a forest act because, because we wanted to remake or like make something new out of the oldest act that we had before. But it felt a little bit wrong to sort of throw the player right into a forest right away. So that's why we have the, the washed up on the, the river bank and the, the clear fell is a little bit more open. So then we can have, it's to give a little bit of time and more impact when you actually get into the proper forest area and to make it seem more scarier. It's like more build up towards it. 
Awesome. That's really cool to hear. Uh, let's start to look at some of the questions that you guys have been asking. So uh, top of the line right now is, uh, do you ever fear that much of the hard work that you're doing for this world design is uh, going to go unnoticed under like a lot of the flashy auras and skill effects that we often have in the world? Uh, not, not so much. So, well, it would be maybe during the like 20th playthrough, but everyone has to to start from the beginning and everyone is a new player at some point and then you would be a lot slower and you would be able to soak everything in. And with the atmosphere and the lore as well, it's it's more something that's there if you if you really want to sort of delve deeper and find out more about those kind of things, but it's it's not something you we force the player to do, so you, you can definitely do just straight for go for combat and complete quests quickly if you want. But yeah, that that actually brings up another point because with quest design, we nowadays we try to try to make them quite obvious so you can kind of understand them or sort of get the gist of what you're doing, even without listening to the to the dialogue. Like you get it just from the greeting messages of the NPCs or sort of the surroundings to get the context. So it's a, it's a tricky one, but yeah, I, I, I'm kind of fine with people not listening and like going through everything super closely too. So it's, yeah. Yeah, and there's always going to be those people who are really interested in that kind of stuff, and so they're obviously going to appreciate yeah. that work a lot. Um, you mentioned like that you're not too worried about the people going through on kind of their 20th playthrough, uh, seeing everything and noticing all the little details. Are there any specific details that you kind of fit into the world that are specifically for those people playing over and over, uh, beyond just kind of the procedural generation we already do? Well, it's, it's more like we try to make things harder for them with the <laughs> increased randomization. So, yeah, but that, sure. that would be more for Reese's talk later, I think. Yeah, for sure, and I'll be uh, there too, so if you have any questions at that time, feel free to ask Reese those. Um, I have one here. Uh, I got a Bloodborne or Grim Dawn vibe from the snippets that we've seen so far. Uh, what kind of influences are we taking for the atmosphere and environments in Path of Exile 2? Uh, just a general... Um, Influences from other places, or oh uh, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, from games and also from other experiences you've ah, okay. had. Yeah, there, there's some obvious ones like Diablo 2. Like it's uh, it, in many ways, it feels like we we try to sort of carry on uh, that exact atmosphere. And there's also games like Dark Souls, which is the sort of creative direction and artistry there is amazing. And there's Certain like Berserk and Attack on Titan is like two um, two manga that I really like in the way that it has quite a sort of large and cruel world and people run around and they don't quite understand everything about it, but it creates a very nice feel. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Dark Souls, which I believe from what I've heard is a game that you're very, very fond of and is also a game that's very famous for its world design. Is there yes. anything or any concepts specifically that you've pulled from Dark Souls that you're particularly pleased with how they've played out in Path of Exile? Uh, I'm pretty sure they have a tree with hanging bodies in it somewhere. But <laughs> Almost certainly. It's, it's actually a little bit uncanny because you... It's you will end up doing quite a lot of sort of concept duplication almost, like in the way that they do, like they handle graveyards and statues and even monsters. It's kind of hard to not do the same, but we, yeah, we, we try to stay away from it. But there's certain very memorable monsters that, it's like these veal skeletons in, uh, yep. you, yeah, you know which one I'm talking very about. Very familiar, yeah, unfortunately. That, yeah. Sort of very iconic that was, I'm not sure it was deliberately taken from there, but maybe it, it's impossible to play Dark Souls and not get the thing sort of stuck in your brain to come back later. Yeah, for sure. Uh, actually, a question that someone asked me last night at the VIP dinner was, uh, do we make a lot of concerted effort to avoid copying other games, or do we kind of just allow for the fact that sometimes we're going to have overlap and that's fine, we're going to do it our own way? Well, sometimes it, it's impossible to, to avoid 
everything because especially when you have a very large uh, company that is like 60 artists now or something like that and I they, they will do things that uh, like it exists in some game somewhere and you can't really know but obviously we try to avoid the super obvious things but yeah yeah, for sure. That's always really interesting. Uh, another question here we have. Uh, plays are very attached to the shattered sound in Path of Exile. Uh, have you done much of the uh, sound design and working around uh, getting good feelings for them? And how do we sort of approach designing a sound? Uh, sorry, what was the first part? Uh, plays are very attached to the shatter sound. You may have uh, noticed that. Uh, the were shatter very sound. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that one is. It's very hard to deal with that kind of thing because. Something that's been like that you've heard for several years, it becomes like it, it like it's almost its own thing rather than the just the sound. So it it can sometimes be very hard to sort of know what what will be sort of near and dear to players. But we, we definitely do a lot of trying to keep things, but. Like we we update them and make things higher quality, but try to capture the same feel. Yeah, that's um, I mean uh, definitely a, a very popular sound and uh, <laughs> kind of the other sounds. Like, what's your sort of involvement with the the sound design in general? Uh, I know we have a full audio team that uh, is obviously helping you out with a lot of that. But how does uh, how do you fit into that team and, and work with them? Oh, so for 4.0, it was actually Jonathan that took the sort of lead on the, the sound experience, I have to say. But uh, yeah, uh, I think we're up to, yeah, we have four people in the sound department, well, five, in, including Camille, um, that does all the, the composing. And well, especially with Camille, I guess I work closely to get the sort of right feeling and the atmosphere of the areas. And yeah, when, when you play the, the demo later today, you will definitely hear the, the influences where it originally came from. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as a, a programmer, I often have to mute the sounds for a variety of reasons. But uh, playing 4.0 for the first time with the sound on was an entirely different experience for me. Yeah, I, I really, really hope that people will turn the music and all the sounds back on and give it a, like a full playthrough. <laughs> Surely for at least the first playthrough, guys. Uh, with Path of Exile growing so fast and having so much crossover content and maps, uh, how are we looking to avoid sort of the visual clutter that's slowly growing in the game? Um, well, we, we already make maps a little bit different and more simplified. Uh, well, it depends. Like, when it comes to environments, it means like a lot less like stones and things that can sort of break your flow, but well, it, it depends. It, it, if is the question referring to effects more or? Uh, I think it, it's probably mostly referring to the effects and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I once said, there's like we have to sort of find a line between having sort of satisfying impact feel and as develop and at the same time once you get the attack speed and all the like the sort of multiplicative skill system like it it's a tough line but yeah we're we're definitely working on getting into work in both those situations yeah, and I mean, in my work with uh, a lot of the effects artists, it's definitely something that they're constantly pushing for is making sure their effects can be seen through everything, but don't overwhelm players and stuff like that. So yeah, and it's like all the explosions have to be super quick, just so that they disappear quickly, so you can see the monsters underneath. That that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question uh, here is: uh, Will we get ca player character voice lines back in PoE 2.0 and their reactions to quest lines and world events? I think we've actually done some work on this. Yes, we will. Yeah, we will have a lot of that, of course. It's, uh, I see it more as a atmosphere building than sort of, well, it is the, player, the players reacting to things, but it's not, not as much, it's more kind of having 
like really cool and atmospheric one-liners almost. Uh, so we, we wouldn't really have the player character sort of have a proper dialogue with NPCs, but it's more like trying to en enhance the feeling of things just at the start of areas and at, yeah, at certain points. Yeah, for sure. Um, previously, we were exiled because RAF didn't punish people by killing them, uh, this question believes. Uh, but now we start uh, out by being hung. Is there a change to the background society of RAF, or is this a perhaps different society entirely? Well, this is a, a different time and place. So it's a Esomite uh, society, and it's on a small island to the, to the right hand of the world map. But, well, I, I can't go into too much about the story itself, but it's, it has quite a few parallels, but also quite a lot of new things to it. That's uh, always good to hear. I tried to get spoilers. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, what's the, your favorite aspect of the, the new world for Path of Exile 2, and what was one of the toughest aspects for creating it? Uh, the, like when it comes to specific assets, hmm. I would say the, well, the player characters is probably the, the sort of biggest deal and what, what we spent the most time on. So. Yeah, I would, I would have to say that. And it's also because they have been, like it's been such a long time coming where we, we have kind of been held back almost with the animation and like we, we sort of choose not to create new animation because we know that the new sort of rigs and characters are coming almost. Or, well, maybe not we choose not to, it's just that it takes so much more time. But now with the new characters, we will just be able to, like, we have a new, a new skill that, like, I don't know, like a backflip shooting arrows, like that type of thing is much more easier to do now on all of the characters, while before the, it was just so, so time consuming and like complicated, we just, couldn't do that much of it. Yeah, definitely, and I believe like we've even gone so far as to have uh, like the run, walk, uh, jog animations inside of the build based on your movement speed. Oh yeah, that that was quite a big thing actually because uh, one of the criticism of the game was the, especially the run animations were quite like we had this quite a slow jog as you start out the game, and, but you click, quickly get really fast, and, but it's the same animation, just sped up, which looks quite wrong. So now I have three different speeds that sort of merge, blend between each other, and things should just look so much better and more natural. And especially with physics and sort of bouncing shoulder pads, then like, everything would just look correct and sort of nice instead of yeah. It, yeah, it'll be good. I mean, definitely the first time I hit a Quicksilver in 4.0 and suddenly started full-on sprinting, it was a very yeah, different it's, experience. Yeah, it's extremely satisfying. Yeah, the, it's fascinating, actually. When, when we first got those in, like, it was just running around doing nothing was kind of fun because it, like, it was very satisfying and cool about it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is there any concept art that we've done that has uh, influenced or inspired actual uh, physical gameplay and, and design? Um, I have to think about that. Well, a lot of the bosses work like that, where we make something large and really cool, and then that sort of determines how, like, what the, what the boss skills will be. Like, an example would be the Lachlan in the demo you just saw, which had this dragging arm. Like that, it made it very obvious for game designers and animators to create these like sort of epic slams. And yeah, the, the same actually with that, the bell crow, uh, where just had this gigantic bell in it. And then we sort of decided to make it a big part of the quest where he at some point goes and rips the, the bell down and starts to slam it at the player. So I, yeah. I think it's, 
you, you probably get the best result if you sort of go both from concept to game design and from game design to concept so to sort of make sure everything fits really well with each other. Yeah, definitely. I mean, collaboration is a huge part of game design all the time. And uh, yeah. the teams all work together so much. It's uh, a really core part of how we deliver the game. I remember specifically with Lachlan, uh, I heard that uh, when Jonathan was first practicing, he often would dodge behind and get slammed by the back hit <laughs> on, uh, on his hits, and he wasn't very pleased with oh, that. Oh, yeah, he was so close to dying against the crowbell as well. <laughs> Always a good time to do those live demos. Uh, with Path of Exile 2, we're putting out a lot more 3D armor models and uh, revamping a lot of them. Uh, are we going to see the same thing happening for a lot of the uniques? Oh, yes. Yeah, I touched on that briefly. And since we have quite a big throughput now, we will first do all the base types, but then we will sort of keep the pace up and go through all of the uniques as well. And, well, that, that's... Some, it's a like several year dream that will come through once that is in there. Uh, I have a question here that the camera angle looks slightly different in uh, 4 compared to the previous versions of the game. Is that something we've actually done or is it just uh, yes. a trick? Yeah, th this is actually quite a big deal because it lets us... Um, like it, it's quite a bit zoomed out and it's less... It's not as much fisheye lens, as I would call it. So basically, you have the, the camera look, like if I'm the camera, and like it goes down like this. It's like smaller like that. Before, it was quite wide like that. So this, like it lets us have a more zoomed out feel at the, at the same time as performance-wise. It's not, it's not actually worse. And personally, I also love the sort of slightly more old school feel that it gives like uh, yeah seeing it in the graveyard especially like it, yeah it's just oh look looks nicer and better for gameplay i would say too just because of the zoom out aspect uh the next question i have is uh, are we planning to make use of any cutscenes for the storytelling with parts of exile 2 we currently don't have plans for that but we, with the new character rigs and models, it's actually easier to do things like the like the, the intro sequence when all the characters escape and jump into the water. With the old characters, that would be incredibly time-consuming, and it would look so much worse. So, well, it depends on what happens with the story, I guess. It it's it's more possible now, but it it wouldn't. Probably not cinematics, or at least we don't have plans for that at, at this moment. Uh, are some of the old microtransaction outfits going to be updated with the new physics and stuff that we're developing for 2.0, or Path of 2? Yes, we will have all, all MTX will be forward compatible and will, of course, look quite a lot better. And it's, it depends on what it looks like, but if if the shoulder pads lends itself for having the proper bounce add, then we will add it. And this is, of course, a huge work task. This is like, well, it's thousands of hours for people to make this work. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It'll, it'll be very fascinating, actually, to see what the old, old MTX will look like on the new characters. Yeah, definitely. It's going to give looking, them a lot of new life. Looking forward to that, yeah. Awesome, and kind of like on the same vein, can you talk us through sort of how these, uh, how the changes we're making and when Chris talked about how we're going to be revamping a lot of the original campaign uh, on the art side and finding improvements and introducing new text to it. Can you talk about how that's going to kind of affect that campaign? Um, well, it's a, it's a purely visual upgrade in the sense that it, it mostly brings textures back up to to sort of modern standards, and the most notable things will be sort of correct metals and like wet areas will actually look wet. Yeah, there's there's some good stuff coming to uh, the belly of the beast area. There, 
like the flesh actually looks kind of wet, and it, we can like use shaders that sort of makes it animate and pulse. And yeah, there's it will actually be quite big update in that sense. Yeah. And is it going to be coming kind of all at once, or are we going to be slowly rolling this out act it, by act? Just because it's there's so, so many assets, so I, I, more slowly, I would say. We try to focus on the sort of biggest and easiest things to do first. So, for example, the well, the Twilight uh, Strand and uh, the encampment, the first encampment, remaking that was to get a, a really good thing early in game. But then. Using the belly of the beast example, it can be a, as easy as changing just four textures to be more modern can like sort of change the feel of an entire tile set quite a lot. So. Yeah, definitely. And I think we're releasing uh, the new Line Eyes watch with some of that improved tech with, with 390. Yes, yeah, yes. So you guys will get to see it uh, not too far in the future. Um, kind of following along with the, the world updates, are we going to see those same updates into uh, hideouts and maybe sooner or later? Uh, they, some of them would happen automatically, depending on when we update the tile set. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, hideouts will basically be updated at the same time as their sort of counterpart in the game, I would say. Yep. And uh, one last question before we wrap up: uh, Can you ever see uh, Path of Exile ever incorporating any fourth wall breaking content, such as the cow level from Diablo 2? We. <laughs> We did discuss like a cyberpunk version of, <laughs> of Path of Exile, so we decided not to do it, but <laughs> we'll see. It was, yeah, if I remember correctly, that discussion, it was scarily close to getting a go ahead. <laughs> I take it based on that statement, you weren't super excited by the concept. Well, it's, yeah, I would, Probably best to avoid it. It's <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to sort of know exactly what like would happen to the feel when once you have done something like that. It, it's hard to step backwards, I guess. Is what I'm saying. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's uh, about all the time we have for this. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, hang out, and in uh, the next five or so minutes, Chris will be showing up for his 390 demo. But otherwise, uh, I hope you guys have a great conference. Great. Thank you.